my last guest, Tom Huner, spoke about guardianship proceedings. And I wanted to talk for a bit about Article 81 guardianship proceedings and the role of a court evaluator. As you may recall, Tom mentioned that when an order to show cause is filed with the court, and these are usually in Supreme Court, the judge will appoint a court evaluator. This person is like the eyes and ears for the court and needs to report back to the court on all sorts of matters. I've been a court evaluator and it is a difficult job. You have to figure out what is going on with this person, with their life, with all the people in their life, with the decisions that need to be made, with the resources they have, with the assets, with all the liabilities and so on. So I'm showing you right now exhibit B. This would be attached to the body of my report as a court evaluator, just to give you an idea of really what does this mean to be in a guardianship proceeding like this? And what does a person who's investigating need to tell the court about? So here we go. So the first point says, does the person alleged to be incapacitated agree to the appointment of the proposed guardian and to the powers proposed for the guardian? Now, the person who's the subject of the guardianship proceeding is the alleged incapacitated person. And so that phrase is used throughout all of the various papers in the proceeding and here you'll see in my exhibit B. Next, does the person wish legal counsel of his or her own choice to be appointed? Next, can the person alleged to be incapacitated come to the courthouse for the hearing? Next, if the person alleged to be incapacitated cannot come to the courthouse, is the person completely unable to participate in the hearing? Next, if the person alleged to be incapacitated Incapacitated cannot come to the courthouse, would any meaningful participation result from the person's presence at the hearing? Next, are available resources sufficient and reliable to provide for personal needs or property management without the appointment of a guardian? Next, how is the person alleged to be incapacitated functioning? with respect to the activities of daily living and so on. Next, what is the person's understanding and appreciation of the nature and consequences of any inability to manage the activities of daily living? Next, what is the approximate value and nature of the financial resources of the person alleged to be incapacitated? Next, what are the person's preferences, wishes, and values with regard to managing the activities of daily living? Next, has the person alleged to be incapacitated made any appointment or delegation pursuant to various laws? Next, what would be the least restrictive form of intervention consistent with the person's functional level and the powers proposed for the guardian? Next, what assistance is necessary for those who are financially dependent upon the person alleged to be incapacitated? Next, is the choice of proposed guardian appropriate? And so on. Next, what potential conflicts of interest, if any, exist between or among family members? And so on. Next, what potential conflicts of interest exist involving the person alleged to be incapacitated, the petitioner and the proposed guardian. And next, are there any additional persons who should be given notice and the opportunity to be heard? So this is a lot for a court evaluator to get through. They've got to really investigate what's going on. Why is there this need for a guardian and what are we going to do? So if I could give you my two cents, it would be to plan ahead. Put the things in place, the documents in, places, in place, the resources in place, the people in place, so that you do not have to be the subject of a guardianship proceeding. Now, in some cases, it may just be inevitable for whatever reason, but I truly do hope that people will find enough reason to plan ahead 
to not be the subject of one of these guardianship proceedings if they do not have to. So this is Ruth George with Ruth P. George Law, PLLC, Trust and Estate Attorney. This video, as with any video I do put out, is for educational purposes only. It does not establish an attorney-client relationship, and I hope to see you on another video.